But I would have to say is we've got to remember something else that we've seen earlier in the Old Testament, and that is power struggles between the northern and southern tribes. Now, there's no such thing as northern and southern kingdom, but at this time that I'm going to be discussing now. But power struggles, power struggles between the northern and southern tribes in Israel, which go all the way back to the days of Joshua and Judges. Now, it's not until later in Israel's history that we actually end up with a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah with their respective capitals at Samaria and Jerusalem. But prior to that, we see power struggles between the important northern and the important southern tribes. For instance, Judah and Ephraim often stand out as very important, powerful tribes. Judah being from the south, which will become the south later, and Ephraim, although it's really central in the country, will represent the north. It becomes the north later. And I say that this goes back, and it's kind of strange, we don't have the time to get into all of the, well, why did this take place? And how did this take place? But as time goes on, the southern kingdom, some, southern kingdom is sometimes simply called Judah. Judah being the important tribe for a long time down there. The northern kingdom simply becomes called Ephraim, like in the book of Hosea. Ephraim is just synonymous, not with what was at one time a small, well, it was rather large, but small in comparison to the whole nation, a small tribal territory that belonged to the, the descendants of the man Ephraim. So Ephraim becomes the northern kingdom, Judah becomes the southern kingdom, but in the earliest days there's simply power struggles between the important northern and the important southern tribes. Now let's look, for instance, in 1 Samuel. Now this is just after the days of the judges, and I think that you can actually date this back quite a bit earlier, all the way to the days just after Joshua and into the period of the judges, struggles between the north and the south. And if you can get ahead of me in your mind now, you can see where we're heading, that that 2 Kings 17 is just another clog in the wheel. It's a very, very important one. It may be as the divisive thing that really begins to separate them at that time. But prior to that, there's already a separation between the north and the south. And I'm talking about prior to the division of the kingdom, at the death of Solomon. Now, we know there's a division there. And at the, at the death of Solomon in 931 B.C., you actually have officially a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom with kings Rehoboam and Jeroboam, with capitals at Samaria and Jerusalem. We would know that the, that would exist. And by the way, that's several hundred years prior to 2 Kings 17. But I think that we can move quite a bit earlier than the date of the division of the kingdom, the official division and find some references. 1 Samuel 11 and verse 8. Now this is before um, there are really any kings. Saul has just, just now become king, so we're in the very, very beginning. Uh, or he's really not king. He's, he's been anointed a little bit earlier. <clears throat> he's really not ruling the people, but this is just in the very beginning of the stages of the monarchy. And tell me what we're going to do then with 1 Samuel 11 8. When he numbered them in Bezek, uh, this is speaking of Saul, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. Now, you've got to stay with me in your chronology or this won't make any sense to you tonight. There's no division of the kingdom. We don't even have a kingdom yet. Saul's going to become the first king. The land doesn't divide until after Saul, David, Solomon. And then it divides, and it's already spoken of here in 1 Samuel 11, 8, as Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern. That's remarkable. Chapter 17 and verse 52. I can give you several references for this. 1752. You may want to mark those in your Bible. They'll be easier to find for you later. They're marked in mine, so I just share that with you if you want to do something with yours because, you know, as you're reading along, let's say, from Genesis onwardly, and you come across these, 
then you know you're already you already know the story of the old testament so you already know about northern and southern kingdom and so these references don't surprise you until you remember well, well wait a minute we're not to the kingdom yet so how can we have a division of it that happens after solomon's death and if you keep that thought that chronological thought in your mind it's surprising to see the nation referred to as we find here uh, David ran and stood up on the Philistine, cut off his head, and the Philistine saw their champion dead. They fled, and the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted. Uh, chapter 18, verse 16. I can think of these three references just quickly. Next chapter, verse 16. And Saul saw that he behaved himself wisely he was afraid of him of david but all israel and judah loved david because he went out and came in before them so what we're saying is that we see a mention of israel and judah long before the death of solomon which is when the nation formally splits into two political empires now, it may be going through your mind, well, this is the work of a redactor. But that's not even enough. Redaction only brings up-to-date terminology. Redaction can't rewrite history, the events of history. Redaction can only bring up-to-date terminology. Because you may be thinking, well, you know, there's no Israel and Judah because there's just one kingdom at this time. And so a redactor goes back here after Solomon's time. That have to be after Solomon's time and fills in Israel and Judah. Well, <clears throat> let's just assume that's possible. Let's assume that's what took place, he, that he filled in, that he replaced something with Israel and Judah. What did he replace then? He's got to replace something. Something has to be there that speaks of two parts to the country, two parts to the empire there. Whether they call them Israel or Judah, I, I don't know what they call them. This may be the work of a redactor. But redaction can only bring up to date terminology. The concept still has to be behind this of a twofold division in the empire. See, that's why I think the Second Kings 17, which is just a standard way that most Christian interpreters read Samaritan history, uh, simply is not early enough. Uh, that's a certainly a very important cog in the wheel, but it's just not important enough um, to be the first thing that starts everything off. We have to go back earlier in history. Uh, if you turn over into Second Samuel, don't we remember that whenever David became king, one of the things he faced continually at the beginning was the diplomatic problem of uniting the kingdom? Second Samuel 2, verses 1 through 11. Deal with this, these verses. I don't know that we have time to read all of that, but at Saul's death, <coughs> David is king over part of the empire and Saul's son in verse 8 is king over the rest look at verse 10 Ishbosheth, Saul's son was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and he reigned two years but the house of Judah followed David division of the empire chapter 3 <clears throat> verse 1 there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David And jump down into verses 9 and 10, so, well, I can skip really to 10. To translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and Judah from Dan to Beersheba. And chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, which is actually where the uniting of them under David takes place. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David, all the tribes of Israel to David, unto Hebron, which is in Judah, and spake, saying, Behold, we are bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. So verse 4, David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. And it's clearly pointed out that something happens way back in the early history of Israel. <clears throat> That's not our purpose to discuss that in, in Old Testament history. But we have to attach that to the very beginning of our study of Samaritanism here 
or I think that we'll be somewhat misled. Now, it may not just uh, produce serious problems of deception if we didn't think about this and started uh, the history of Samaritanism in 2 Kings 17, but we certainly would not have a complete history of them. Um, we've got more taking place than just racial religious problems. The first problems are political problems. I mean, obviously, the problems are problems of political jealousy that start back in the early days. Remember, whenever Joshua is dividing up the land for the tribes, some of the tribes are bickering, well, we don't have enough land. Dan says we don't have enough land, and so they have to go and try to capture some more land uh, further north. And there's a lot of bickering and jealousy. Remember, we're dealing with Israel. You know, those people we met in the wilderness, Israel. They're experts at bickering and complaining and and that's exactly what takes place then. Not everything is told to us, you see, in the book of Joshua. But when you understand what I'm saying now, you can read some of this understanding back into Joshua and put yourself back there as a carnal Israelite. I mean, certain parts of the land were better than other parts. Certain parts were rocky and others were a little more fertile. Some of the tribes got larger slices, you know, and square miles than other. And so if you were part of that tribe that got some rocky land and it was a small portion, well, you're going to be envious. And so what happens? Judah has some good choice territory, and it's a large section. And Ephraim has some good choice territory, and it's a large section. And the tribes of the north kind of rally around Ephraim, and Benjamin kind of attaches itself with Judah in the south. And you had this political rivalry that starts right away. We don't have all of the ins and outs of it, but we have enough to put some of that to be, to, together and begin to, first of all, formulate some uh, political rivalries that take place, which later just compounded with religious and racial ones. So I think that much earlier in the history of Israel, the formal schism occurs um, much earlier than I have reference here to Solomon's death in 931 B.C. And um, uh, through the books of uh, Samuel, first and second, and Kings, first Kings, that is, of course, we obviously have a north and a south, or after Solomon's time, we obviously have a north and south, and the kingdoms don't get along very well. Only when it is um, uh, politically expedient do they ever join together to try to attempt any accomplishment as uh, a unified whole. Most of the time they're bickering against each other and more times than not fighting each other, the North fighting the South and vice versa. So with that in mind, then let's return to 2 Kings 17, which I'm not trying to minimize as an or the important chapter, 2 Kings 17. <clears throat> but what I've given you just thus far, I would say, <clears throat> is basically where um, we have material that would actually provide us with a fifth alternative, a fifth alternative for the origin of Samaritanism. It's not the higher critical view or Josephus view or the Samaritan view or even the typically Jewish view as well as the Christian view today that Samaritanism begins in 2 Kings 17. I don't think so. I think that what becomes Samaritanism, and by the way, I mean that people still think, well, we've got something entirely different that's taking place here in 2 Kings 17. So you can't call what's happened earlier that which doesn't happen until 2 Kings 17. In other words, Samaritanism. But Samaritanism as we think of it also doesn't occur in 2 Kings 17. It's just some beginnings of what's going to develop as Samaritanism as we know it later. So in other words, we've got just a long process of time. There's not a particular date or time where we can say, now there were no Samaritans prior to this, and puff, there's a Samaritan. Samaritanism begins right here. No, it's a whole chain of events. It starts off with political, geographical rivalry way back in the days of Joshua and the Judges and reaches an important milestone in 2 Kings 17. And there are other important milestones, but this is one important one. Verses for this would be the entire chapter, 41 verses. It's very important. <clears throat> of course, we're not going to read all of that. We've read some of that before. Let's just read what's appropriate. Verse 5, beginning with this. 
Then the king of Assyria came up through out all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Halan, Tabor by the river goes on the cities of the Medes. Now what do we have? The king of Assyria deports some of the people of Samaria and they end up over in Mesopotamia. That's one side of the coin. And then as I told you last time from verse 7 down through 23 is a, a prophetical spiritual commentary on why this took place. Now if you were preaching or something that's the best part of the material in the chapter right there because basically it says that Deuteronomy 28 has been fulfilled. That blessing will follow obedience and deportation will follow disobedience but we're not um, preaching on that that idea or that material let's jump down into verse 24 and get some more of the historical issue the king of Assyria brought men so we don't want to separate verses 6 and 24 from one another in our mind as we're studying this you've got Israelites taken out of the kingdom in verse 6, and the king of Assyria, verse 24, brought men from Babylon and these places and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they, I mean, they're purely foreigners. They possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. So here we have two different groups of people. We've got remaining native Israelites. Not all of the people are taken out. We've got remaining native Israelites and imported foreign colonists. And I'd like to ask you this question with that behind us. Which of the two groups is involved in religious syncretism? That becomes important to begin with. And I think often interpreters start off on the wrong foot here. With what I've said before, Getting to this here tonight, I think we can see from that that the division goes back quite a bit earlier. So we don't want to be too hasty to read something into 2 Kings 17 to say now we've got the initial uh, formal beginning of Samaritanism when in fact we might not really have that. We've got two groups, remaining native Israelites and imported foreign colonists. Which of the two is involved in religious syncretism? Obviously the colonists not the Israelites. That is a fact often overlooked in reading this chapter. The pagans are the ones involved in religious syncretism, not the Israelites, um, in parenthesis, Samaritans. People think, well, now we've got the Samaritans. Remember, the only time Samaritans occurs in the Bible, that is in the Old Testament, is 2 Kings 17:29. But it doesn't occur here with the New Testament meaning. We can't read the meaning of a word back 700 years earlier into its first appearance. We can't take the New Testament meaning, that is, and read it back into 2 Kings 17, 29. It simply is a geographical reference here, the people of the land of Samaria, Samaritans. See, if we call someone a Vermonter, probably we mean someone who lives in or is from or something Vermont. We don't mean someone who's picked up the spirit of or is involved in this, that, or the other syncretism. It's just a statement of where they're from. That's all we have here in 2 Kings 17, 29. But back to my question, which is involved in syncretism? Uh, verse 25, obviously the imported foreign colonists, not the Israelites. See, you probably didn't realize that. Maybe... You were just too hasty in your reading here, thinking, well, I know what's going on. So it was at the beginning of their dwelling. Now, this is in light of verse 24, the imported colonists, not the Israelites, that they feared not the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Jump down to 29. How be it every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. Uh, the men of Babylon, men of Sukkoth-Binoth, 
the men of Kuth made Nergal, the men of Hamath made Ashima, the Avites, Nibhaz, and Tartic, and the Savarvites burnt their children in the fire to Adramalek, and the Anamalek, and Anamalek, the gods of Sepharvaim. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They served the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. Okay, so let's don't read any more there. What we start with is syncretism in the pagans, according to these verses that I've just read. The next link in the chain is intermarriage. I mean, that would just be inevitable. Intermarriage between the pagans, the foreign imported colonists, and the native, the remaining native Israelites. And it's intermarriage with those who have corrupted the worship of Yahweh that brings some of the religious problems in, the spiritual problems in to bear on the question of the Israelite people who are remaining behind. For instance, if we go back to <clears throat> verse 26, let me read these verses we skipped over. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner, <clears throat> know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. And the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom you brought from thence. So he's one who's already gone now into the area of Mesopotamia, who is being returned at this time. And let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. And one of the priests, now this would be a full-blooded Israelite, an Israelite priest. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them uh, how they should fear the Lord. And the other verses, 32 through 33, that I just read. Now what's going to happen if you've got a pure-blooded Israelite priest who's been brought back to be the instructor to be the instructor, the, the official religious instructor of these pagans. Well, of course, we see the pagans fear the Lord now that, that uh, this priest brings true worship to them. Verse 33, they fear the Lord, but they also serve their own gods. And if you've got an official Israelite priest over them, and he's not going to... By the way, remember, we're talking about the northern kingdom. The reason it goes down the tube here is it's apostate. I mean, it has notions of true religion, but let's don't fool ourselves that the priest who came back was like a true priest. I mean, a true one of the faithful line of Aaron and the Levites. That certainly would be uh, corrupting of the evidence if we were to ever suppose that. But if he comes back, then that puts some type of, in, at least in the eyes of the people, some type of official check of approval on what's going on. And what's going to happen with the remaining Israelites there? Well, when you live close to people, it doesn't matter what their religion is, the next step that logically follows is intermarriage. So although the pagans begin, and that's really what this chapter is saying, it's not ascribing syncretism to the Israelites. That's not what this chapter is saying. It's ascribing religious syncretism to the imported foreign colonists. But then I think we would say after we have said that, that intermarriage would follow, which would then bring syncretism over into Israel. And so I think the big question after that would be, well, was Samaritan, the Samaritan religion and faith syncretistic? I mean, what is Samaritan religion like at this time? Well, let me give you just a few interesting points of evidence here. If you're following me thus far, we're just saying that in 2 Kings 17, we really, we really shouldn't see Samaritanism as we understand it in the New Testament. We should understand just another link in a long, long chain of events. That the people who are syncretistic here are the pagans. But then if through intermarriage 
we would assume syncretism is brought over into the Israelite community, then we should expect to find that in the Samaritan faith. Well, here's one thing I would say. Number one, there's not a shred of evidence in the New Testament that the people called Samaritans are religious syncretists. Can you think of a place where that statement could be contradicted? Okay. A worship site? Let's, so you're talking about John 4? All right, let's jump over to John 4 and just and, and read the passage and see what the passage has to say. See, I said earlier when I first started this series on Samaritanism that thankfully it's well known, but sometimes things become so well known they become stereotyped, and stereotypes often don't bear out under scrutiny. But don't take what you think is my implication there too far until I get through talking. So I would assume that the first thing that would come to your mind would be John chapter 4 and verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, where is syncretism there? Syncretism means that you're combining the worship of Yahweh with the worship of a pagan deity. Now, they may be misguided on the location for worship. By the way, if they were, Jesus goes on to correct everybody, them and the Jews, that there is no correct location for worship because God is everywhere. You can worship him anywhere. But let's assume that they're a little misguided on the place of worship, that for the Jews it was Jerusalem, so they're worshiping Yahweh up in Samaria. We don't have religious syncretism here. We've got a geographical notation. And don't take, what was that, verse uh, 22a, you worship, you know not what, to speak of syncretism. Well, you just worship false gods. No, he's just saying you don't know what religion is all about. You don't know the God that you're worshiping. Ye worship, ye know not what. I mean, I think in a sense what we could take from that is the fact that they were, were worshiping the true God. You worship the one that you don't know. Who is the true God, Yahweh? Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. It's not so much we Jews worship the true God and you Samaritans don't. It's that we Jews have the true religion and understand what we're doing and you Samaritans don't. The God is the same, though. Ye worship, ye know not what. We worship, we know what. We both worship the same thing. We know and understand. No, in other words, we understand that, and you don't. Question. It, there's a reference here to Second Kings 17, 29, and they're setting up high places. And the problem with the high places throughout Kings is that um, aren't they syncretistic? Or? No, they're not necessarily syncretistic at all. Not at all. Um, <clears throat> go back to what I think I might have said last week about the worship of the calf, um, starting way back in Exodus 32, coming out of Egypt, and then the uh, two rival calves that the uh, northern kingdom set up at the day of the split at Bethel and Dan. Uh, I said, I think what we have there is, is a worship of the true God under images, not syncretism there. A worship of the true God under images. Oftentimes you find the southern kingdom and the kings involved with that kingdom also worshiping in the high places. The high places were not only under every green tree and on every high hill in Samaria, but on Mount Zion as well in Jerusalem. And oftentimes you find the good kings whose hearts are good before the Lord worshiping in the high places. These were religious shrines that the, some of the earlier nations had had 
um, because of their beliefs in fertility and their beliefs in uh, spatial reference to God, the higher the hill, the closer to heaven, therefore the closer to God. Under every green tree, green represents life, fertility, and fertility was so important in the ancient world, right up until modern times, everything depended on the weather, weather patterns and the growth of crops. But they could take over those shrines and of course, obviously, I'm not denying that the northern kingdom didn't worship pagan deities about 90% of the time. Well, so did the southern kingdom, though. So what's new there? But we can't necessarily read into every time we find high place that we've got syncretism involved there. Um, I would say probably the vast majority of the time you don't have syncretism. You either have Yahwehism or paganism. You don't have a combination. You either have people worshiping Yahweh, probably in a confused manner. Certainly, if they think they have to go to these high places, they're confused about it. But they're not mingling the worship of God with the worship of the deity of the Babylonians. That's what I'm saying. They've just taken over a shrine that belonged, by, belonged to some of the earlier nations. Um, or if you don't have... So, uh, I don't think we have anything in the New Testament. That's my first point. There's not a shred of evidence in the New Testament that... And listen to the way I said it. Uh, we got off the track there. There's not a shred of evidence in the New Testament that the people called Samaritans are religious syncretists. I mean during New Testament days. That's all I'm saying right now to this first point anyway. We've got to start there and work our way uh, backwards. that during New Testament days there's not a shred of evidence that the Samaritan people are religious syncretists. You see, we've got these problems, this tension between the Jewish people and the Samaritans, but you don't ever find the Jewish people accusing them of worshiping a false god. You don't ever find that. You've got other types of tension, but you don't ever have that. Then the second thing I would say is all through recorded history. And what did I tell you? We started that two things that characterize the study of the Samaritan people are gaps, long periods of time, maybe a couple of hundred years. Gaps in information on them and changes. They emerge on the other side of this gap, quite a bit different from where and how we see them earlier. Gaps and changes are two things that characterize any study of Samaritan history. So number two, all through recorded history, but just what we know from them. Samaritan theology as we know it is never shown to be mixed with paganism. Samaritan theology is never shown mixed with paganism. I'm going to try to get all of this said tonight, and then maybe I'll be back on schedule with what I want to do here in this <clears throat> part of the class. And I've given you back on the first message the references that we have, that is the sources that we have for references to Samaritan history and their theology. And you just don't have any references. Uh, you don't have any in the new, you don't have any in the old to uh, paganism with the Samaritan people. And the third thing I would say would be note Ezra 4, 2. Note Ezra chapter 4, verse 2. You've read it before. We'll take the time to read it again. <clears throat> now again, we don't have precisely the people that end up in the New Testament here in the uh, post-exilic period, Ezra 4, 2. Neither do we have the people precisely as they appear in 2 Kings 17. You may grow tired of me saying that. That is simply an attempt to remind you that we have many links in this chain. We, just, we don't have full-blown, full-grown Samaritanism as we think of it until a later period of history. we just got to keep that notion, that reference in our mind. This statement that's made by 
quote the Samaritans, unquote. I mean, they are the people. We're going to have to use that term Samaritan so we know what group of people we're talking about. But we can't read New Testament Samaritanism back into Ezra 4.2. The statement they make here in uh, Ezra 4.2 appears to have been made in all sincerity. Uh, to Zerubbabel, the first of three leaders of exiles back to Jerusalem, and it appears that Zerubbabel so received it from them as a statement given in all sincerity. They are called adversaries in verse 1. They came to Zerubbabel. This is essentially 200 years now after the last time we've seen them in the Bible, 2 Kings 17, from about 700 to about 500, just to round the dates off rather uh, severely, but uh, from 700 to 500, about 200 years. They came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and saith unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. Now, of course, you could say they're lying here, but just catch, try to catch the flavor. What, what, what would you pick up as the flavor here? They say, We seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esau had and king of Asher, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, You have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. I mean, you don't, I don't catch any hint here of religious syncretism. There, may, there obviously are some problems or Zerubbabel will say, Well, of course, you worship God like we do like l-i-k-e like we do and it's the same god and so obviously you can come and help us we're the same people he didn't do that there's a problem between the two groups but a syncretistic problem hardly well, yes again in the question of syncretism maybe this gets to be some theology but are they lost or are they are they true followers well uh, that does go rather deep um, well, remember Paul even says not all they who are Israel are Israel. I mean, there was a whole lot of the Jewish people who were unsaved. If we had to talk about ratios, the majority of the Jews of the Old Testament were lost. Uh, so for the Samaritan people, uh, Jesus clearly says in John 4 that you know, there's a difference between the Jewish faith between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people. You're worshiping in a different place which does not have the, the sanction of the prophets under the Old Covenant. Only Jerusalem has that, as God revealed that to David and to the prophets that said to build the temple there, as with the case of Nathan and Solomon. There's certainly a difference there. There's certainly a difference in the fact that you don't know really what you're doing or what you're worshiping. That salvation... Salvation, as we read there, salvation is of the Jews. So I would say that, that although um, the Samaritan people are worshiping uh, Yahweh, and although they certainly are mixed in blood by this time, that um, soteriologically speaking, no, these people are not, these people are not, quote, saved at this time. Salvation is of the Jews. Salvation comes to the Jews. Salvation is from the Jewish faith. And although you're worshiping Yahweh and you're not mixing that worship with um, pagan deities, whenever you have taken it upon yourself to deviate from the law of Moses, you've got another system of worship, you've got another place of worship, you've got other priests, you've got, you've got everything is different because they've broken off from the true people of God. Then no, God couldn't count them as saved people. Uh, let me go on with with some more history here. It does appear that they're going to end up in uh, 2 Kings 17 syncretistic because of intermarriage. So let me maybe explain, try to reconstruct here for you what probably happened <clears throat> all the way from 2 Kings 17 right down to New Testament days. Maybe this will be the most important thing that we can say. It'll try to tie all of these things together. Reconstruction of Samaritan development perhaps we could call it, from 2 Kings 17 right down to New Testament dates. 
Okay, now I don't know that I'll follow my notes here, so let me just give you these points as they come to me and you make sure that you note that there are some distinctions here. Number one, originally, the Israelites and the pagans exist side by side. I mean, that appears to be how they start off in 2 Kings 17. The Israelites and the pagans exist side by side. The Israelites are either just atheists or pagans, or you may have a few of them who are true Yahvists in 2 Kings 17. If God, according to 2 Kings 17, sent the king of Assyria to destroy the nation, he sent the king of Assyria to destroy them because of their sin. So the vast majority of the people do not serve God, love God, or follow him. But let's remember, obviously, in a nation that size, there are bound to be many scores, several hundred, or maybe a few thousand. I, I'm not the person, no human being could put a number on the people in the northern kingdom who sincerely loved God and worshipped him faithfully. We're going to see some evidence for this here from the Bible, as a matter of fact, later on. But there were sincere worshippers of God who followed him completely with their whole heart. And because they were so vastly outnumbered by the the, um, pagan, quote-unquote, Israelites, then uh, they had to suffer with the other Israelites uh, with the Assyrian conquest. So you've got Israelites, pagans, existing side by side. Number two, syncretism begins with the imported foreign colonists. When the teaching priest returns, you see, there's no syncretism prior to that. We were told, uh, find the verse again, verse 25 of 2 Kings 17, that uh, God sent lions in because they didn't fear the Lord. Remember, syncretism is a combining of two religions. So initially, uh, the imported foreign colonists, as I say in my first point here, are simply existing side by side with the Israelites, worshiping their own false gods. They're not worshiping the true God at all. And then I said, secondly, syncretism begins with them when the teaching priest was brought back to Israel. This, in other words, was the foreigner's first taste of Yahwehism the worship of Israel's God, Yahwehism. Okay, number three, <clears throat> later religious reforms carried out in the still intact southern kingdom of Judah were able to reach across the border and affect these people and their descendants, of course. These reforms would affect not only the syncretistic pagans, but the remaining Israelites as well, the atheists as well as what would then become syncretistic Israelites. course remember now uh, i could even have thrown this in as another point that as as we go down later and later and later in history we don't have two groups of the israelites and the pagans they're intermarrying there they become one group therefore the religions of the pagans would come over with them that syncretistic aspect um, into the religion of the israelite people so whatever reforms are taking place in the southern kingdom are going to affect the people in the north whether they well, they're going to be descendants of the Israelite pagans mixed together. Uh, let me give you some references. Uh, religious reforms happened under Hezekiah in 710 B.C. Reference for that, which we're going to need to turn to, would be Second Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses 1 to 8, or 1 to 11, rather, 1 to 11, and verse 18. What, what this amounts to, and I don't want to spend too much time here, is we're having to do, do a little bit of Old Testament history, and so much more could be said. 
you know, to help us really understand the immediate context here that we don't have time for since we're not studying Old Testament history, but Samaritanism. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah. Now, we're around 710 B.C. at this time. That means the northern kingdom has fallen. There is no Israel. I mean, it's a separate kingdom. But obviously, there are remaining Israelites as well as the imported pagans. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, those are two northern tribes. Now, they've already been carried away into captivity, but remember only a representative sample of them. The leading citizens were carried away into captivity. So Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. And he goes on to explain why they couldn't keep it earlier. Verse uh, 10, so the post uh, these were the people that carried the, the dispatch, the letter. Passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. So you've got, of course, the majority of the people rejecting the um, overtures of Hezekiah, who was a good king. But we're told divers of some of the northern tribes, Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun, humbled themselves and came. Verse 18, For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh and Issachar and Zebulun. You see, you get all the verses together and you've got several different tribes mentioned. Had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one of you. I mean, these were difficult days here, and so if they didn't meet some technical stipulation in the law of Moses, then uh, Hezekiah said, God forgive them, you know, at least they're down here. And I'm sure that that was the right attitude at that time in Israel's history, that if they missed some technical legalism from the law of Moses, then God would overlook that. The important thing is that they were down there. Another religious reform happens under Josiah about a hundred years later. Let's date that around 620 B.C. Now, surely by this time, 100 years after the fall of the northern kingdom, you've got a total mingling of the people. We can't now speak of the Israelites and the pagans. After several generations, so much intermarriage has taken place that they are one and the same. Some of them better, some of them worse. Same book, Second Chronicles chapter 34, verses 3 to 9. The eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. They break down the altars of Baalim in his presence. And the images that were on high above them, he cut down in the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. Verse 8. Um, Skipping down that far now, in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Maaseiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. And when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought, uh, skipping down, that kept the doors, had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, and of all the remnant of Israel. And of all Judah and Benjamin, they returned to Jerusalem. Those are, those are two recorded religious reforms that took place, where what's going on positively in the southern kingdom would surely reach across the border to the northern kingdom and would affect the people whose heart was open and willing at that time. Now, here is maybe one of the most important verses that I would put under our third point here because it comes as late as Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is uh, quite a bit later than Josiah in 620. 
That's Jeremiah 41, 5. Even as late as uh, the time of Jeremiah, uh, he speaks of the fact that faithful men could still be found in the north. Okay, so it's right here under, under this point, number three with, with Jeremiah um, chapter 41 and verse 5, that I would say this. There are faithful men in the north. It's these faithful men, and they're in the minority for sure, but it's these faithful men that become what we speak of when we say Samaritans. Not all the other people, not the other Israelites up there who are maybe agnostics or atheists or pagans or whatever. It's the faithful men up there that will eventually become, and it doesn't happen in the Old Testament. It happens much later in history. That will eventually become what we think of when we say Samaritans. Now, Jeremiah 41, the city has fallen. We're at the close of Jeremiah's ministry. And notice this fifth verse, very interesting. There came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, from Samaria. And we're familiar with all three of those cities now from last week. Shechem, Shiloh, and Samaria. This is not only after the fall of the northern kingdom. This is after the fall of the southern kingdom as well. Even four score men, 80 men, having their beards shaven and their clothes rent and having cut themselves with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. I mean, that proves that you've got a group of people up in the north who still worship God. He's the true God. He's the living God. He's the only God they worship but they wouldn't want to ascribe to them the complete knowledge that people like Jeremiah would have of the Lord being a part of the kingdom down south. Having their beard shaved and their clothes rent, a sign of grieving and mourning. <coughs> Having them cut themselves, a sign of grieving and mourning. Uh, I don't think that we should interpret this as uh, a contra Leviticus episode where they're cutting themselves after the pagan customs and manners you know god said don't cut yourself well he even said don't cut your beard in a certain way but it was don't cut it in um in a an a, uh, attempt to copy the pagans these are just signs of mourning and grieving their beard shaven over the fall of the southern kingdom which they recognize to be the true nation of israel having their beard shaven their clothes rent having cut themselves with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. And if you read on the next few verses, you see what happens to them. It's not, it doesn't go so well for them, but they are people coming to seek the Lord. These are the Samaritan people. And they're not called Samaritans at this time, but these are the people that become the Samaritans. All right, no questions along there. All right, number four, at the end of the 4th century B.C., 332 B.C., Alexander the Great invades Samaria and congregates many of the people into Shechem. When I say Samaria now, I'm meaning the city at this time, rebuilt city. Alexander the Great invades the city of Samaria congregates the people, removes them, in other words, from the city of Samaria to the city of Shechem. An archaeological note is interesting here. In the year 1952, a cake of legal Aramaic documents written by Samaritans was found east of Shechem in a cave. I'm using Samaritan now as residents of Samaria. 1952, a cake of legal Aramaic documents written by Samaritans was found east of Shechem in a cave. And they were left by 200 Samaritans who tried to flee. 
tried to escape Shechem from the corralling of Alexander the Great. But uh, we know from other sources they were called and butchered. And just before they were called, they hid these uh, legal documents in a cave. So we know that Alexander has uh, a role to play in removing the people from Samaria, which they had rebuilt as a capital city to Shechem. In any case, just before this, they had built a temple on Mount Gerizim where a very strict form of worship of Yahweh was taught. Maybe you're beginning to see, I'm sure you're beginning to get a little better flavor of the Samaritan people. They're not exactly what you might have thought they were when we began this study. You may be asking yourself in your mind, well, well what was wrong with them then? Well, I think I've already explained in answering another brother's question here is, is God said that you've got to meet in Jerusalem in the Old Testament. This is the place to worship. You've got to follow the kings that I set up here. You've got to follow a true liturgy. You've got to have the descendants of Levi. You see, they always remain the true descendants of the, uh, of the Aaronic priesthood uh, stay there in Jerusalem. They're not up in Samaria. The people have the true people, remember, from the north come down to the south to worship. So the Samaritans aren't what you may think that they were, that j they were all mixed up, they were racial half-breeds, that they were. Uh, but that's not the biggest problem in the world. You think they were syncretistic. Well, there's no evidence for that, though. Um, not the people that we call Samaritans. Surely there were many other Israelites when they intermarried with the pagans, they picked up their religion and worshiped foreign gods, and they just eventually pass off the scene. But the people that keep descending, I mean, we can trace their descent down. They stay as uh, some type of group of people, and then they end up in the New Testament as a Samaritan people, the woman at the well of Samaria, John 4, a certain Samaritan, Luke 10, and so forth. Uh, they are not religious syncretists at all they taught a very strict form of worship of Yahweh maybe now you're beginning to see why Jesus would have said to the Apostles go to Jerusalem and Judea first Acts 1 8 and then to Samaria because they're so closely related not just by blood but in religion and by religion they're so closely related they're worshiping the same God they have the same religious beliefs except these things that I've already described to you. As I've said before, the Samaritans reject all of the Old Testament because it won't explain their theory of their origin. It doesn't mesh with that. They reject all of it except the Pentateuch. Well, you can't do that and be the people of God. You can't reject all the prophets and the writings and just keep the law. Those were the very words of God to the people. So that they are lost. There's no question about that. Um, not really any more lost than the lost people of Israel, but they're outside the covenant faith. And yet a Acts 1-8 seems to imply they're outside the covenant of faith, but then again they're not. I mean, they're out, but they're not Gentiles. They're something or somewhere in between. That's why Jesus treats them the way he does in the Gospels. He, he treats them in a way that is shocking to the Jewish people. Because he sees the fact that they do worship the true God. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand what they're doing. They don't know why they're doing it. They've rejected a large section of the Old Testament. But there is a place in his heart for those people. And he goes to them at every opportunity. And one last thing I guess I could say. That brings us really up to New Testament times. But... Uh, their temple was destroyed, you see, by the Jews in 128 B.C. And so after that, they began to put an extreme emphasis upon the law, the Pentateuch. And they became even more legalistic than the Jews, if that's possible. You see, whenever the Jews begin to lose everything externally speaking in the Old Testament, what happens whenever we come to the New? You see, whenever you lose that, they, they put an extreme emphasis upon technical matters, upon the law. 
and uh, the Samaritans even more so, because at least the Jews have their temple. They've got Herod's temple there, and the Samaritans don't have one. 